Leaning Saints. You're full of expectation. <laughs> I'm a bit nervous tonight. <laughs> um, I've never spoken on this topic before, as far as I know. Um, and it was, I, I talked to somebody who uh, was part of the church here who obviously was curious about heaven. And for many of us, I think we've lost loved ones recently. And some in kind of very difficult circumstances. And these are kind of asking questions. But this topic I've been given is just heaven. So I don't really know what the questions are. I don't know what your questions are. And I was sort of thinking what they might be. And I made a little list here. And I'm not promising that I'm going to be able to answer all these. But some years ago, when I was here, probably 30 years ago now, I put together a little evangelistic tract called What is Heaven Like? Um, and uh, I've given a copy of that. I'll have it with... Just have a drink, thank you. Wait a second, I'll give it to you. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> Takes a lot of energy to get down and up back onto this <laughs> stool. <laughs> and we are encouraged to conserve energy these days, aren't we? <clears throat> <laughs> um, yes, so um, so I wrote this tract called a um, little gospel tract called "What Is Heaven Like?" And I've passed a, I passed I can't find the original, but I've passed a, a copy on to Mike, and um, it, it'll be available for you if you want it. I think you'll have to photocopy it or something. Um, so here are some of the questions. When, when you're speaking, at times you think, well, we always just think, who am I speaking to? <laughs> um, what do I want to achieve at the end of this? What, what's the purpose of this? Where am I going with it? And it's, it's good to remember that actually lots of the stuff that we have in the Bible is on that same basis. That's to say there is a context to... Romans and Corinthians and Galatians, and there's a different context each time. So when we come to these things, if we're studying them, if we're giving thought to them, we need to ask kind of questions like, what is the context? What, um, who, who is saying this? Who is he saying it to? What was their experience? We presume that he, let's say the writer, knew who they were and knew what they would understand by what he was saying to them. Um, so it's important to sort of try and work out what the questions are. So I've got a little list here. Um, I, I guess these are some of the questions that people have in their minds. Maybe they're not in yours. And if they are, I don't want to disturb you. So if this is one of your questions, don't worry about it. Do we sleep between our death and the resurrection? Will we recognize our loved ones? Should we use the rapture to frighten people into faith? What is heaven like? Will we be like the angels? What kind of body will we have? What is heaven like? Well, can anyone tell us what heaven is like? I'm going to try. I'm going to try, but I want, I'll warn you now that the key word here is like. What is heaven like? It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. So there's nobody, I share this with everybody in the whole world, there's nobody who knows what it's going to be exactly like. But we have illustrations, we have words which give us a flavor of some of the aspects of these things. And that's what I'm going to try and touch on tonight. So um, let's, uh, let me make a start. I've got notes tonight, I'm going to try and stick to that. I'm not very good at sticking to notes. Um, but I want to try and stick to these simply because there's a, a lot to say. So I want to make this point that what we're talking about now is not speculation. It's not, I'm going to try and stick to what we know. You, do you remember that kind of famous thing that Donald Rhodes felt said all those years ago when he said, 
that are known knowns and that are unknown knowns and that are unknown unknowns. Uh, in other words, he's saying that there are things that we know and we know that we know them. There are some things that we don't know and we do know that we don't know them. And if we do know that we don't know them, sometimes we can work on that. We can do some research, we can do some thinking. But there are also unknown unknowns, things that we don't even know that we don't know we don't know them. And it's like that when you come to this topic because in many ways the scriptures are very reserved about what they say about heaven. And there's a whole... Um, there's a whole kind of understanding that's grown up in hymns and choruses and all kinds of things about heaven, which are really almost kind of like folklore. And when you search for the roots of these in the scriptures, you don't kind of find much about it at all. Although if you open your Bible, you didn't do it just for a moment, but if you open your Bible, you don't need to go very far before you come across the word heaven, because it's there on the first page. It's there several times. And the interesting thing is that when it starts off, it begins like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's how it starts. Notice heavens, plural. Actually, it's even more perplexing. It's what they call dual. In Hebrew, you could have singular and plural, and you could also have dual. And this one is dual. So it says God made both heavens and the earth. But two? Now Paul speaks about being present in the third heaven. So just how many heavens are we coping with here? And how are we going to untangle them? Now I know that kind of popular song and all the rest of it tells you that there's a seventh heaven. But in the Bible, there are three heavens that are mentioned. And the word heaven in its origins, it, as we find it in Genesis, has to do with things which are above. And in a sense, things that you reach towards, but you can't really attain. So we have, in the biblical revelation, we have three heavens. We have one heaven that we can't reach, which is where the sparrows fly. And we have another heaven where we can't reach, which is where the stars shine. And we have another heaven that we can't reach, which is God's habitation, God's home. And the Bible uses these words in different times, and it's using the same word, but it's describing different aspects. And that's why we need to look at the context and say, what is all this talking about? And then to try and make some, um, some idea, some hypothesis, do you know? we've got scientists here so I'll need to be careful but usually with kind of science you, you start off with a hypothesis that's a, an idea, a hunch if you like, speculation and then you kind of do some work on it and you get to the stage where um, I'm like, uh, yes, you, where, where you, you test it you test it as much as you can you try to disprove it and if you can't disprove it then you have a theory and then you're supposed to be able to test the theory, but now you don't try to disprove it, you try to prove it. And if you can absolutely prove it, it becomes a law. Okay? So there are different levels of kind of proof. And we're not going to get anywhere near declaring a law that heaven is like this, full stop, and nothing can be taken from it or added to it. So this is a hypothesis. This is, we kind of start it off. And, I, and I, I'm looking at things and I'm going to suggest some things that I've never heard anybody else say. You, that you may think they're wild um, speculations. But um, I've tested them over a good number of years and haven't been able to disprove them. So it's at the hypothesis stage. <laughs> Are you still with me? Okay. Um, this, is what it's, this is what Peter says. And I, I want to remind you that what I'm going to try to deal with is not human speculation. I'm going to try to deal with what facts we have. This is Peter in Second Peter. So, so, yes, Second Peter chapter 3. And in verse 1, he says this. It's a longer passage, but it, it, I think it's important for us to know where we're getting our information from. 
He says this, Beloved, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Beloved, I write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now are preserved by the same word and are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now that's a quite a long passage of scripture to read, but it's, it's Peter saying that things haven't always been as they are and they're not going to remain as they are. In other words, although scientists like to kind of postulate that things are unchanging and are absolute, in fact, the Bible tells us that things do change. And that situations have seen, context have changed. There was a world before this one um, that we read of in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, I think it is, where it says that the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. Um, and, and then we go on to the time of Noah, and there's a, there's, a, a, there's a new world. When Noah comes out of his ark, he sees something that he's never seen before. Everything was changed. Uh, the great fountains of the deep were, grow, um, were, were broken up. It isn't just that there was um, uh, the, the waters had risen and then they'd gone down again. Uh, what happened here is everything changed. The geography had changed. All kinds of patterns had changed. And that isn't the last change that's going to be. There is going to be a, another fundamental change when this earth will change. And Isaiah kind of hints at it, if you like, but in the book of the Revelation, John has this vision and he says, and, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had passed away. Whenever I say that, I can't help but hear a kind of an echo in my mind. Can you hear it? If any man be in Christ, he has become a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. So those who have received the spirit of Christ's life within them are part of a new creation. The thing is that that new creation and this creation overlap and we have to learn how to live in the overlap and that's another topic for another time but there's a time coming when this one will pass away the old earth will pass away and it goes on to say behold all things have become new when the writer to the Hebrews writes he speaks about some people who I believe were genuine believers he says that they have partaken of the, of the spirit of the good word of God. They have um, already begun to share, partake in the powers of an age to come. So they're already, if you like, beginning to live the life of the next creation. This really is complex, isn't it? They're already beginning to live now. Heaven is here, not in full measure. Heaven is better than this. Heaven is even better than early Christian fellowship. Can you believe it? <laughs> some of you are kind of nodding <laughs> in one way and some are another some are saying mm -hmm, and some are saying mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't know the half <laughs> no I don't know the half I don't know anything at all but uh, um, I can guess because it's um, life is generally kind of battles and bruises and blessings that's the way uh, of life generally um, and there's grace there's grace that God gives to us but what I'm trying to say is that, that, that this sense of being beyond, the sparrows are beyond us, the stars are beyond us, and this heaven is absolutely beyond us. There's no way that we can get there. There's one of the Psalms that says, um, who will ascend into the hill of the Lord? 
And it's kind of a picture of getting into the presence of God, where God's presence is made clear. And then it makes this little list, if I can remember it. It it says, um, those who have clean hands and a pure heart, those who have never sworn to do something and not done it. And you look at this list and you think, I'm sunk. You know, I can't tick any of these boxes. But there is one who has ticked all the boxes. There is one who has lived this perfect life. And as we're saying this morning, he laid it down to make it possible that we might benefit from it and begin the life of the also and the also and the also and the ultimate. So this is a a, a wonderful thing, but it's vast. It's absolutely vast. But this is the bit I wanted to get to. It goes on to say, but beloved, do not forget this one thing. That with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, I want, if you can, to kind of hold that in your mind. We're going to come back to it. Because this says something about time. And I have a hypothesis about time that I want to share with you. And uh, you can tell me what you think about it afterwards. But he says, uh, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then he says, But the, Lord of the, the, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away, With a great noise, you see, it's all going to go one day. It'll pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So this theme of there being a new heaven and a new earth is there all the time. But it seems to me that that heaven is available for those who have lost this earth. But one day... We read in the book of the Revelation, don't we? Lots of people, when they get to this, and they say, oh, I want to know how to get to heaven. I want to know if I'm going to heaven, etc. Well, there's a sense in which that isn't, that isn't the, the necessary question, because if you read the book of the Revelation, you'll see that you get a vision of the heavenly Jerusalem coming down from heaven. So, are we going up, or is it coming down? There's there's going to be a coming together of the the renewed and with those who are already in the heaven of heavens. It's it's an amazing concept, this. Lots of people with this kind of, these folky ideas. I was, you all know who I'm talking about. I was listening to someone just the other day who was telling us on the television that he believed his mother was watching over him. And she was there to strengthen him. And that he had been strengthening her brother, but now she'd switched his attention to him. And you think, what in the world is going through this brain? G.K. Chesterton, who was a, a Catholic and a kind of an apologist, once said something like this, if I can quote it rightly. He said, the danger is that when people turn their back on the revelation." that God has given to us. The danger is not that they will believe nothing, but that they'll believe anything. And it's true. The the weird and wonderful ideas that people have, and and, I believe this and I believe that, I believe that every drop of rain that falls and all the rest of it, there's, there's no end to this. And it's all sheer speculation. And faith that's built on speculation is superstition. If there's no revelation, if there's no foundation, if there's nothing that God has given, it's, it's 
It's nonsense. It, it has no basis at all. So we need to stick as close as we can to what the scripture has to reveal to us. So let me read you another little bit here. This is from Paul writing to the Corinthians, second time around as we have it. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13. He says, For since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Now that's, that's Paul saying he believes something. But his belief is based on a revelation. When Peter writes, we didn't quite get to it, but when Peter wrote in that second letter of his, he refers to our beloved brother Paul. And he says, according to the wisdom that God has given to him. Now Paul isn't speculating. He's received revelation, as we were saying this morning. Revelation is a basic building block to things. Jesus rejoices when Peter believes, because it's revelation. He rejoices when the children respond, because it's revelation. And faith can only operate on revelation. It can't operate on speculation. Now this is not, nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight. But I want to say something, uh, just in passing. There is a difference between hope and faith. And I think of hope in terms of what I call long-range faith. Faith is now. Faith is within reach. If God speaks to you and you can reach out and touch it and take hold of it, that's faith. But there's another kind of promise that God gives, which is hope. But it's not the vague aspirational hope that we have. I'm waiting for a number 17 bus and I'm hoping it'll be here on time. You know, it's not that kind of hope. It, it's as certain as the faith that receives something now is. But it's beyond your reach. You can't touch it. And you may think, well, it's inferior to faith. And it's, no, it isn't. It serves a different purpose. Because it's faith which makes endurance possible. If we got everything just by reaching out for things, there would be no patient endurance. But God gives us promises that aren't for fulfillment now. So that we move towards them. Even though we can't lay hold hands Hand, we can't lay our hands on them. It says, doesn't it, of one in Hebrews, that he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Notice how endurance are linked with seeing him who is invisible. <laughs> I don't want to be too mystical, but brothers and sisters, if you can't see invisible things, you won't endure. I'm not, I'm not talking fantasy. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just simply saying that if God does not make clear to your vision things that are otherwise invisible, you won't endure. You might not get to the end of the week. Never mind, endure. It's, uh, it's just that uh, I can't take any more of this, not any more of this. Yes, you can, because there's hope. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will also, with the trial, make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You're able to bear it because you know it's going to come to an end. And you know that there's current grace to see you through it anyway. So hope is really important. But sometimes I think we get them mixed up. And one of the ways that that can affect things is, I've seen this happen fairly frequently, sadly. Often in the cases of severe um, illness, where people, believers, godly men and women, will say, we believe that God has given his word, and we've got the faith to believe for this healing. And sometimes there is healing, and sometimes there isn't. And this may, I hope this doesn't offend you, but I want to say that faith always obtains its objective. So if you don't obtain, obtain your objective it isn't faith it's hope it's hope there's a difference between the two I, I, have, known, I have known individuals, I have known churches who are utterly cast adrift because 
maybe their leader or someone who was very important to them was severely ill and uh, he, he was the prognosis was that he was going to die but some, this person had a word from God and this person had a word from God and they believed and they knew that God was going to heal them and he didn't and the whole church has fallen to pieces you can build on faith faith hope is something that you constantly reach out to you constantly press towards but we need revelation um, so Let me read this one. The, I'm just kind of picking out things which give us bits of information, and we're going to try and put them together in a little while. <clears throat> this is Paul writing to, again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, and he says this, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, and our inward... I'll, read, I'll start again. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, this always makes me smile, because if you read what Paul has told you of his testimony of his life before you get to this bit, you think a light affliction doesn't sound very much like a light affliction for me. Um, our, our light affliction, where's it gone? Um, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There you go. Isn't it worth having one or two afflictions? Isn't it worth having one or two tears if he's going to wipe them away? It, <laughs> it was worth it for Stephen when, as he was dying, he saw the Lord standing. It's worth taking one or two stones to see the Lord standing and ready to receive you. There's grace. There's grace. And at the end, there's glory. So he goes on to say, um, an eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know, this is certainty, this is the certainty of faith that's come from Revelation. We know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed. That mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God. Who has also given us the spirit as a guarantee. That tells us that our earthly habitation is temporary. Um, uh, but there's another one ready for us. <laughs> we have another habitation, another body. But Paul elsewhere kind of tells us that this other body is not an earthly body, but a spiritual body. Now, sometimes people think, oh, okay, so spiritual and earthly are opposites. Not necessarily. It seems that angels, I asked the question, are we going to be like angels? It seems that angels who are spirits have the ability, the power, to change their form. If you look at it in the Old Testament, you'll find that they appear as human beings. Um, when it tells us of the resurrection, it tells us in Mark's Gospel um, that there was a young man sitting on the stone. Do you remember that? It was an angel. But it taken the form of a human being. Jesus, in his resurrection body, was able to do extraordinary things. He was able to cho change his form so that those who walked with him on the road to Emmaus didn't even recognize him. He was able to pass through locked doors. 
it seems that a spiritual body has the ability to take on an earthly physical form at certain times. So it's not either or. It can be either and or. It can be both. Now this is, this is speculation. But I'm just saying that um, if we believe in resurrection and behind all this idea of ultimately being in that new heaven and the new earth is, is, is revelation. If we believe that, we, we know that there's going to be a judgment and that there'll be an end to the one and there will be then the passage to the other. And it, it says that this body will be like a seed and it will fall into the ground and what it brings forth will not be like what fell into the ground. What fell into the ground was a tiny little bit of hard thing um, that was unyielding and it falls into the ground and it dies and it produces wonderful kind of fruit or something like this. I think sometimes I have some strange thoughts. I think in, um, in one of the cities in Japan during the Second World War, there was actually quite a thriving group of Christians. They were vaporized um, when the atomic bombs dropped. But they'll have resurrection bodies. I don't know how this works. I've got no idea how this works. But I just know that our resurrection body will in some way be linked with our present body. And yet at the same time, it will be hardly any... I, this then just comes to mind. We, some years ago we went to visit our, our son, daughter-in-law in America. And we went to uh, uh, one of the big parks where they have these massive trees, you know, kind of 300 feet high. Um, and and I, I looked around to see if I could find a, a seed of one of these trees. And it was about the size of something you get in your muesli. Just a, just a tiny little thing. And there's this tree. You can hardly see the top of it. And there's a notice underneath it that says, this tree is 2,500 years old. I wonder if the seed thought, one day, you wait. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. And yet somehow we will retain an identity with what we have been. There are some, I don't know how well I'm going to do with this now, but there are some anomalies in the Bible which I think are clues. Uh, here's, here's one. On the Mount of Transfiguration, there was an event. Jesus himself was transformed. He'd said to his disciples, um, there'll be some here who won't die until they've seen my, the, me and my glory. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Christ was transfigured. He was a metamorphosed. He, uh, he was changed, absolutely changed. And with him, there were two other identifiable individuals. There was Elijah, and there was Moses. And the disciples recognized them. So there's one of our questions. Will we recognize people in heaven and our resurrection bodies? The disciples recognized Elijah and Moses, even though they'd never seen them. Are you following this? There was something about them which identified them as Elijah and Moses. Now, how could this be? Because if we read the scriptures, it seems that there is a coming day of when the dead will be raised. And there will be the judgment of the unrighteous and the unrighteous. Well, as we are reading and talking about it, that's future. So... <laughs> How did Elijah get his new body when we haven't had the day of resurrection yet? These things keep me awake at night. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't keep me awake at night. I know, I know it's all in good hands, but can you see where I'm going? 
What's happening here? These are anomalies. They don't, they don't fit the evidence that we have. Um, they don't fit the revelation that we have. How can this be? Moses, of course, uh, was buried. So his body was buried. Elijah, you might say, oh, well, yes, he just had his own personal rapture. And he went up, you know, in the chariot. And that's different. But Moses died. He was absolutely dead. And so far as we know, his body is still somewhere in the wilderness on the eastern side of the River Jordan. But at the Mount of Transfiguration, he was there in a body talking to Jesus. These are mysterious things, aren't they? Um, I, I think there's a way maybe we will see this. Let me tell you a little story. I told you a C.S. Lewis story this morning. Now, this one comes from Narnia. Uh, if you remember the story of, of Narnia, there's this, these, three, these three or four children who have gone into a wardrobe and uh, uh, they go into a, a magic land, a, a different land called Narnia. And the first one to go through is the little girl, I think whose name is Lucy. And uh, she goes in through, through the, the, the wardrobe and she appears in Narnia and she has some adventures and then she comes back again. And then when the other children, the older children, kind of meet up with her again, um, she says she's been into this wardrobe, into a land where it's always winter and never Christmas. You know, you know this story. Um, and uh, she's had some struggles with the white witch and all the rest of it. And they say, you, you're only in this room 30 seconds. You, you know, you, what, what, you're making this up. And she said, no, I'm not making it up. But, you know, this, this really happened to me. And this puzzles the older children because Lucy's kind of been one of the well-behaved ones in the family, even though she's the youngest. So they go to the man whose house they're living in, a man named Professor Diggory Kirk, his name is, if I remember rightly. And, and they're puzzled and they're troubled and they're talking to him and they say... Um, but she's begun to, tell, begun to tell lies. And he says, what will well, make she think she's telling lies? And he says, well, she's, she's saying impossible things. She, she's saying that she was um, gone for kind of three days or something like this. And we know she was only in that room for less than 30 seconds. And, um, and he says to them, uh, he says, well, who is usually the most reliable? Would it be kind of Edward, I think, is that? troublesome one, um, or Lucy. And they said, well, this is the strange thing, because Lucy is usually very reliable. Does she tell lies, says Professor Diggory Kirk? No, she doesn't. Um, so that's the strange thing. And he said, well, he says, that's interesting. And they said, but it's impossible. Anything that is true has to be true all the time, and has to be the same all the time. And he says, does it? And they said, well, it's, she was only gone 30 seconds. And she says she was gone for kind of three days. And he said, ah. Oh. He says, that's one of the things that make me think, makes me think that Lucy is telling the truth. And then he makes this statement. He says, because it occurs to me that if there was a land called Narnia that was accessible through this wardrobe, it would have its own time and wouldn't need to use any of ours. You know, poets sometimes see things. Poets sometimes see things and I think, hmm. Hmm. Two different time, not different time zones like, you know, America and us, but two entirely different, I don't, I don't know what words to use, two entirely different time, <laughs> so that anything that happens in heaven is eternal. Let me tell you what the implications are of this. They affect questions like soul sleep. Paul tells us that those who are asleep in Christ, they won't come second, but that when Christ comes, they will be raised first and they'll meet others in the air coming with Christ and etc. Um, and some people say, well, when we kind of lay uh, the remains of our beloved ones in the earth, 
Are they asleep? Well, the body is asleep. But Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So for us, locked in our time zone, we are having to wait. We have the keen sense of loss. They've gone from us. They've left us. But they have passed into eternity. Which has its own time. And doesn't need to use any of ours. So we say we're going to meet them. They say they've arrived. And when we meet them. For us it will be a meeting. For them the two times become fused together. Goodness me, this is worse than particle physics. Um, I don't know. I mean, this, you know, as they dig deeper, I'm not a scientist. I would like to have been, but I, I wasn't. Um, but um, as they dig deeper and deeper into these things, it becomes more and more mysterious. And things happen that they've got no way of explaining. And, uh, and yet they put all kinds of faith in the little bits that they think they do understand. And there's, but every time they go, they find more questions and they've got answers. We, we live in mysterious things. We are of the spirit and we live in a spiritual realm, but we also live in the earthly realm. This was the glory of man, uh, that angels are spirits and can become it seems, take on a human form. But the glory of man is that he is both flesh and spirit and was designed to be equally at home in both. And one day, even our body will become a spiritual body and it will be as natural for it to function in that spiritual world as your natural body is to function in this world. These are mysterious things. They're mysterious things. One of the things about heaven, and this is why I wrote this little tract, um, is really to ask the question, well, what is it like? Because when you get into, say, for example, the book of Revelation, I'll see if I've got, I've got a note of this somewhere, if I can find it quickly. Um... Okay. So I think this is actually a quote from, from that little text thing. So you've got all these like words. When you get different books in the Bible have different genres. Um, and the, the book of the Revelation is what they call apocalyptic. And there's apocalyptic writings in Ezra and in Zechariah and in other places as well. And, and you... It, it's often used when people are in danger. Um, we have a, a sister, see how naturally I say we, being here with <laughs> the Holy Christian Fellowship, uh, in China, don't we? Our first name is Aleri. And I know there was a time when the, there were certain things happening, and uh, she was warning us that when we wrote to her to be very careful and not to say anything. But we would get occasional kind of emails from her which would say things like um, yes, I'm making this up now but it was, uh, the, the weather's kind of threatening here, it's not too good but um, when, when the family are together, just ask Father um, uh, you know, if, he, if he's got a hand on this and, and the idea was of course that if her emails were intercepted in a hostile environment that hostile government would not be able to zone in on Ilari. And, and you get it happening in, in the scriptures as well. In the book of Revelation, the book of the Revelation was not written to people, this is a quotation from somewhere, I've forgotten where, was not written for people with a lot of time on their hands and a propensity for solving difficult puzzles. It was written to people who were on the cusp of destruction and dismay. They were being hounded from pillar to post by a hostile government. And it was written specifically not to give them a 
timetable of future events, but to encourage them. And I sometimes say my one, my one sentence commentary, this is much as I've made of it so far, on the book of the Revelation is this, God is still on the throne. That's what it says. And they are unable to see things that they could not see with their eyes. Because John has these visions. But if you go through the visions, you'll see there's a little word that's used. I, I got my machine to kind of tell me. Um, I think this word is used 74 times in the book of Revelation. And it's the book like. It's the word like. Because it'll say, these things were like this. His face was like this. His, fa- his feet were like, um, they were like metal that was kind of molten in the fire. They're like, they're like, they're like. And in the first chapter, first chapter, I think there are about 17 of these. Everything is like this. It's not this, it's like this. This is John who has been given vision, visions which communicate truth to him. They, they're not descriptions where you could kind of build another model of it. And if you, you know, kind of during the time of the Reformation, people kind of tried to draw pictures of um, the events of the book of the Revelation. And they are hideous. They're absolutely hideous. One of the wonderful things that John sees in the book of the Revelation is at a certain point he sees a throne. And this is the throne he sees one sitting on. And then as he looks again, I'm missing a few verses out, he, he saw a lamb. As though it had been slain, having seven eyes and seven horns, standing on the throne of God. Now, if you try and draw a picture of that, it will be hideous. I'm old enough to remember the fairgrounds when they used to have freak shows. And they would have deformed animals with two heads or five legs or things I don't know whether anyone else here is old enough to remember those hideous days. But they're hideous. They're grotesque. It's, it's not intended for us to create a mental picture of it. it crea- it's intended to convey an idea to us. I'll take me th- let me take that idea simply. This is a lamb. It it's, looks as though it's been slain, but it's standing. Th- this lamb has obviously passed through death... And has now taken its place in the throne of the universe. This is a lamb that through weakness has entered into death, come through it, and is now at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. And as John sees the vision, he sees that this lamb has seven eyes and seven horns. Now, in the language of the apocalyptic, eyes have to do with intelligence and knowledge. And seven is a number which speaks of perfection or completion. So he sees a lamb that has perfect, complete knowledge. That's what he sees. And it has seven horns. Because in the language of the apocalyptic, the horn is the symbol of power. And seven is the number of completeness. So he sees, if you interpret it through, through the vision that he sees... He sees someone who has passed through death is now present in the throne of heaven by the side of another. He's standing, he's triumphed, death is over, and yet he still has upon him, if I dare to say it, the blood and congealed. It's almost as though a moment has been captured in eternity. When he's died, he's been raised, he's ascended, he's at the Father's right hand, All power is given to him in heaven and on earth. All knowledge is given to him. All information, all power is given. Now, why is that important? Well, you think about it. If he had had seven eyes and six horns, he would know all things, but he would be limited in what he could do. Because he doesn't have perfect knowledge. He only has six horns and not seven. Are you following that? I'll say it again. Shall I say it again? Okay. (laughs) For those of you who haven't dropped off yet, okay. (laughs) Um, Okay. He he sees this symbol. When the book of Revelation starts off, it says, God has, has sent and signified these things. 
So the book of Revelation is full of significations. And if you picture the word significant in your mind, you'll know that the first word, first four letters are sign. And it's the same in the Greek. It's full of signs. Signs and symbols. Everything is like something, but is not exactly the thing that you think you're seeing. They're communicating truth, and it's in a code, so that they're not speaking about the events of the day, apparently. Um, but let's go back to this, this lamb upon the throne. He has seven eyes, which means he has all knowledge. He has seven horns, which means he has all power. If he had seven eyes, that's to say all knowledge, but didn't have seven horns, in other words, there was a horn missing, there would be things that he couldn't do. He would know everything, but there would be some things that he couldn't do because he didn't have seven horns. If he had seven horns, he would have all power. There'd be nothing he couldn't do. But if he only had six eyes, there'd be some things he didn't know. Are you beginning to get the picture? But this lamb has passed through death, has ascended to his father's throne, is standing in the victory of his resurrection life, and has all power and all knowledge. And this is our Lord Jesus. There's a lovely, lovely line in one of Wesley's old hymns which says, And all the attributes divine are now at work for me. It's our Lamb. It's our Savior. It's, it's the one who has our names on his hands. It's the one who died for us. And is ruling with us in mind. And he knows every detail of our lives. There's nothing that except, uh, uh, creeps under his knowledge. And there's nothing that he can't do. The idea, brothers and sisters, is you to look at that vision and see it and think, I feel safe. Even if the Roman army is kind of heading towards me, even if Diocletian is about to unleash his worst persecution, even if this is happening, this, even if it looks as though the churches are falling, whatever's happening, whatever is happening on the earthly level, there's a heavenly vision. And in the heavenly vision, he sees a throne. And brothers and sisters, we, in these days, I think more than in many in my lifetime, and I'm 80 next month, um, it, in... in in this era in which we live, we need to be able to see the throne. If, if, you, if we don't see the throne, we will not survive. We will not endure. We'll be crushed with what might be and what is. And it, it's overwhelming. You, you just, if you just kind of work your way through the headlines of a newspaper, it, it, there's, a, there's a dozen impossible situations. I don't know how politicians sleep at night. I don't know how anyone who really believes any of the truths of these things sleeps at night. There's no solutions. There's no solutions to any of it. But if you see the throne, there is a throne. It's not a committee up there. And it's, it's, not, it's not a government. Praise God, I didn't vote him in, but he's taken his seat and he's not going to lose it. And he's, he's, in, he's, he's the one that's in authority, all power. And it's okay. God is still on the throne. So what about heaven then? And those that we have lost, as we would say from our side, this timeline. We'd say, yes, they've gone. But there, it's eternal. There's a verse in Hebrews which speaks about Christ's death on the cross like this. And it says... Through the eternal spirit, he offered himself without spot to God. You see, what happened in Calvary wasn't just a moment in time. It was a moment in eternity. If this makes any kind of sense at all, it was etern an eternal moment. It, it, it never grows old. I, again, I recall reading some years ago now a history book and this historian just made this comment in passing and he said, he said, to appreciate history you have to have a sense of loss. And I, like, I'm interested in history and I thought, yeah, that's true. You know, that there is a sense of loss. And then I thought, when I think of the cross I have absolutely no sense of loss. 
Because it's not history. It's eternity. It happened in history. It's a real event. It took place in time and space. But it was through the eternal spirit. There was another dimension to what was happening. And the power of that lives on. That's why we can say to people, look to the cross. Like we were singing that lovely Horatio Bonar hymn this morning. It, I'm thrilled to hear you kind of sing Horatio Bonar hymns. Um, th there's some solid stuff in those things. You know, the Scottish Presbyterians used to only break bread every, I think it was once a quarter or something like that. It might have been even less than that. And they would gather people in the, for big conferences, convocations, they call them. And they would spend two or three days preparing to break bread. And they would um, have sermons preached to them about uh, the recognition and confession of sin and repentance to be sure that everyone was in a right place uh, to commemorate and to join again in this feast with the Lord. And, and they would be together for two or three days. And Horatio Bonar and Andrew Bonar wrote lots of hymns that really, if you think about them, the background to them are these vast um, celebrations of breaking of bread with hundreds, maybe thousands of people together. And the one we sang this morning is one of those. But he's, he's looking beyond the elements. He's looking beyond the bread. He's looking beyond. And he's seeing straight through to the cross. And Wesley does the same. You see, and, and it, isn't, it isn't clever poetry. There's a power in it. There's a power in it. And if you sing it with your heart open and receive from it, you're there. You're transported. You stand at the foot of the cross. You hear the victory cry, it's finished. This isn't history. This is now. It's not an echo. Echoes die away. This doesn't die away. Psalm 22. <clears throat> Psalm 22. You know, this is the psalm that begins, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And people say Jesus was quoting David from Psalm 22. I'm not so sure that he was. I think David was quoting Jesus. <laughs> I think in the spirit of prophecy, because David was a prophet, remember, he saw something, he heard something. He heard, he heard a voice, what kind of 1,500 years in the future. And he heard this cry, my God, my God, why is that forsaken? And it fitted David's current situation. And he writes a psalm. But I don't think Jesus was quoting it. I think David was quoting Jesus. Because that eternal moment, remember, stretches backwards eternally as well as forwards. That's why those like Abraham who were justified by faith before the cross, were able to be justified. Because Calvary stretches eternity both ways. Here's a little illustration I told you before. Um, I don't know why I look at the clock and I've got no idea what time we're supposed to be finishing. <laughs> Are we all right for a bit? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I told you this before. Years ago, we went to, I think it was Madame Two Swords or something like that, like with our family. That's Margaret, myself, and seven children. Um, and we are going to see the, the, the waxworks and all the rest of it. And we're in this queue to one of those old fashioned turnstiles. And there's a lady there at the old fashioned turnstile. And um, you pay your money, and she gives you a ticket, and clicks a button, and the turnstile clicks and moves one person forwards. Are you familiar with these? You youngsters, have you ever seen a turnstile? <laughs> okay, so here we are in this queue. When you, when you have seven children, life is a queue. It's, that's the way it works. Uh, and you're, you're in this queue, and we've got the four oldest ones in the beginning, in the middle, and then we've got Abigail on a wheelchair, and then the, usually me carrying two others, one on each arm. And, uh, we go, and they, they get there, and she lets the first one through. No payment. She lets the second one, third one, fourth one go. Now, why is she letting these people through when they haven't paid? Because she saw me coming with the money in my hand. And the reason that God could let Abraham and Isaac and all those other heroes of faith through is because God saw the man coming with the money in his hand. 
The purchase price was there. So the effects of Calvary spread. You see, this defies time and space as we understand it. But there's an element here that is beyond our understanding. And heaven is part of that. Heaven is part of that. <clears throat> what is it like? I'll read you a little uh, in a moment what it's like. There's a lot of things that it's not like. There's a lot of things that it doesn't have. And there's a whole bunch of things that it does have. Let me see if I can find that. Um, here we go. <clears throat> These are the, the last couple of chapters in the book of Revelation. Uh, here's what the Bible tells us categorically about those visions of the heavenly state. For example, this is Revelation chapter 21. It tells us there's no more sea. And you say, oh, that's a shame. I like the sea. Um, but for the Jewish people in particular, they were, they were nervous about the sea. They didn't like the sea. They weren't traditionally good sailors. Uh, when Solomon and another king whose name is, uh, escapes me at the moment actually had a navy, it was manned by Phoenician sailors. Um, that, uh, they didn't like the idea of being out. It's unpredictable. You never know where you are with the sea. Um, there's, there's no more unpredictable. There. There's, there's, everything is... It's, all, it, it's not boring. It's, it, it's just that it won't take you by surprise in the sense that it will suddenly upend everything you'd planned to do. There's no more sea. These, these are statements I'm taking from Revelation 21. There's no more sea. There's no more death. Nor sorrow. Nor crying. Nor pain. For the former things have passed away. All those belong to the former things, the former creation. There's no cowards. There's no unbelieving people. There's no abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, liars. They've already found their place in the lake of fire. There's no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. There's no need of lots of things. There's no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illumined it. And the Lamb is its light. There's no night there. The gates are never shut. Nothing that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. And then to me, this culmination, this most thrilling thing of all, and it just simply says, and there's no more curse but the throne of God and of the Lamb. It seems as those, those two things are mutually exclusive. We have lived our lives, and even if we're taking advantage of all that God has provided for us, we're still living in a world which shows the pain of the curse. Even we who have the first fruit of the Spirit, even we who have the Spirit, we groan as part of that creation. This earth is filled with the groan. There's pain here. There's sorrow here. It's all as a result of the curse. But it says specifically of heaven, there's no curse here. There's the throne. Just the one. Was it this morning I said this? that The temptation was that there should be two, that Adam could have his own throne. You don't need God telling you what to do. God is stopping you eating from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil because he knows that in the day you eat of it, you'll be like God. You'll be making the decisions. You'll be on the throne. You'll be in control. Not in heaven. <laughs> Not in heaven. No, no competing thrones in heaven. No curse. Just one throne. And it is the throne of God and of the Lamb. And there's an interesting development in the book of Revelation. And it's this. That when John in the vision, in the revelation that he's having, sees these things... Initially, he sees the throne and one sitting upon it. And the one, just the one who is sitting upon it, has in his hand a scroll sealed with seven seals written on the back side and on the front side, rolled up and sealed with seven seals. And he, he weeps 
and he weeps because there's no one worthy in heaven or earth to open these seals. And it seems as though God's destiny, God's plan for humankind, if this is God's project plan, if this is God's intention, it looks as though it's going to be forever mothballed. It's never going to be worked through to its completion because of this curse. And no one is willing, no one is able, no one is worthy to open the seals, break them and open them. And as they're weeping, uh, one of the elders, I think it is, comes to John and he says, uh, don't weep. He says, come, I'll show you something. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to break the seals open. God's original destiny for man and his creation is out, out of mothballs. It's back. It's, 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 it's running again. The program is back on course. God is doing what he wanted to do. And then he looks. And where he expected to see a lamb, sorry, a, a lion of Judah on the throne, he sees this lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. And it's an amazing kind of picture. And the throne becomes then, not the throne of God, but the throne of God and of the Lamb. Later on we'll find that there's a river of water that flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And we find right at the end of the book of Revelation that what we're seeing is the throne of God and of the Lamb. When did it become and of the Lamb after the cross and the resurrection and the ascension and the outpouring of the Spirit the outpouring of the Spirit was the proof that the Lamb had taken his place in the throne that all his achievements of the earth had been satisfactory to God had been ratified and now the plan can move on and now See what Peter says on the day of Pentecost. Now he has poured forth this, which you now see in here. The one that God has raised and set at the throne. He's, he, this is what he's done. This is what I was saying this morning. This is a paradigm shift. <laughs> I'm not going to explain what a paradigm shift is again. Ask someone who is here this morning. Um, it, it just means everything has changed. Everything has changed. We're living in a new covenant which overlaps with this new heaven and the new earth. And we are partakers of the powers of an age that is to come. And we live in the overlap. And there are tensions as a result of that in one way or another. But there's also the certainty that what God has begun, he will complete. So what is heaven like? Well, that's, that's the list of what it's not like. That list I've just read to you was all the list of what it's not like. None of those things are here. I try to separate them out, out here. It says, The heavenly Jerusalem is like a bride prepared for her husband. They're lovely things, aren't they, weddings? I cry at weddings, even when they're conducting them at times. <laughs> Wonderful. They're full of hope and expectation and that. All kinds of wonderful plans. And they just and he's the bride. This is such powerful imagery. But please don't ever try to picture you know Christ as the bridegroom and the church as the bride. You're not intended to paint a picture of it, you're intended to feel to taste the flavours of it, to get the impressions of it, to to touch it with your emotions. Uh, not, not with your creative ability to reproduce it. Um, and then he says, the bride, the lamb's wife, that's there in heaven. If I'm understanding this right, those who have died in the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord, have passed immediately into a new time zone, into heaven's time. We are waiting for this, they aren't. They're in the midst of this. They're in the midst of all this glorious revelation. It goes on. Her light, this is of the, of the Jerusalem, 
was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. You can see that it's like a most precious stone, like a jasper, and even then it's as clear as crystal. It's a like put on top of a like put on top of a like. It's that far beyond anything he can give to explain this. All he can do is just kind of point to things which will kind of have a response, if you like. Clear as crystal. This stream, fresh, fresh, coming from the throne of God and the Lamb. Um, It tells us that the construction of the wall was of jasper and the city was pure gold, but not like ordinary pure gold. It's clear like glass. How can you have gold that's clean, clear as, as glass? This, this is, don't try and understand it. Just feel it. That This is beyond explanation. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know this, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. The streets of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And then there's this river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God. From the time of the new covenant, from the time of this this empowering, this river has been touching earth in the lives of men and women. And we drink from this river. You say, oh, this is so mystical, it's beyond me. Okay. Just, just, just feel it. Don't try and answer specific questions specifically. Just see that he's gone to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, he would have told us so. And it'll be ready as soon as you're ready. In fact, it's ready now. <laughs> I don't know whether I dare tell you this. And then he turned it, you're already there. Eternity isn't something that's going to happen. Eternity stretches both ways. And you say, this is worse than particle physics. There's no way I can understand understand this. No, it's not. But these, these things are given to reassure men and women who are at the risk of their lives and never knew what the next day would bring, never knew what the next knock on the door indicated. And this word keeps on coming through. Almost the first thing that Jesus says to every single, I think it is the first thing that he says to every one of those churches is he says, I know. Seven eyes, seven I know. I know your works. To emphasis. I know your works. I know your works. I know. He knows. Wherever you are, brothers and sisters, God says to you, I know. I know where you're at. I know how you judge yourself. I know how I judge you. And to every one of them, there is a promise. And there is this amazing promise given to the church at Ephesus. I've nearly finished, I think. Um, this, this, to the church of Ephesus where he says to the church of Ephesus that they, he has something against them. They've lost their first love. Something that they had, they've, they've lost it. And he admonishes them to remember it. If there was something you had, if there was something in your walk with God, and you remember it, it, don't become nostalgic. Repent. Because if you've known it, it's still available to you, if you'll repent. If you'll listen to what God is saying. Don't think, oh, it was wonderful in those old days, I remember when. Yeah. They do say that one of the differences between kind of a the young mindset and the older mindset is that the old mindset say, I remember when, I remember when. And the young mindset says, just you wait until. Because one group is looking backwards and the other group is looking forwards. Well, look forwards. Look forwards. And he says, look back. And then he says to the church of Ephesus, this amazing thing, he promises them that if they are become an overcomer, if they listen to what he says, if they do what he's told them to do, he says, um, I, I, I want to read it. Um, can you lend me your Bible? Just a second, bro. Thank you. It's, um, I 
Um, it's one of those Bibles that's so <laughs> all concertinaed. And... Do you keep this in your back pocket? <laughs> um, this is Revelation. Um, here we are. We're getting there. I want to read it properly. Um, he says this. He who has an ear, let him hear. So that doesn't just mean the church at Ephesus. It means anyone who has an ear. In other words, if you're listening, if you hear God saying this, right. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Really, can God restore people who've lost their way to that pristine purity, that intimacy with God, that fellowship, that glory? Can God do that? Yes, He can. He can do it. This is His promise. Take you back to the beginning, not losing anything of the things that you've learned. But with that, just that, the glory of those days. Just the glory <laughs> of the genuine Eden, Eden project. Not the one that kind of pinches the name, but the, the real one. Th these are wonderful things. Um, I'm going to just take five minutes. If there are any of these questions that you're desperate to ask uh, and you want to ask, Please put your hand up. Say, will you, I, what about, what about, what about? I'm not promising I can tell you the right answer. Um, all I can do is, I have, I've prayed much about this. And I, I always pray the last couple of verses, two or three verses of Psalm 19. And in the first part, David talks about the revelation that's in the heavens. And then he talks about the revelation that's in the, the word of God. And then I think as a man who is a prophet and as someone who is a preacher, I suppose, I pray this regularly, these prayers. And he, he, he prays that God will keep him not from um, presumptuous sins, as the, our versions usually say. It just says, keep us from presumption and keep us from errors and keep us from filling in the gaps and keep us from extrapolating, you know, so that it says one, two, three, so therefore I can now tell you what nine, ten, and eleven is. Uh, and it's, it's so easy for us to do that. And then at the end of all that, as this man realizes that he's going to be the mouthpiece of God, speaking as an oracle of God, he comes to this last little bit, if I can quote it properly, he says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in your sight. O Jehovah, my rock and my redeemer. And I've prayed it for tonight and I'm praying, I pray that nothing that I've said will be in addition to what God has said. I pray that nothing will be the result of any errors that I have, having knock-on effects. That doesn't guarantee that every word I'm saying to you is true, but I'm just saying that I, I know that these are important things um, and I don't want to add to the scriptures that are terrible consequences according to the book of Revelation for those who add to it or take away from it. But if you've got anything that um, you think, want to say, well, do you have a, a view on this? Or um, I'll try as best I can to answer you. Or if you're too concussed and you just want to sit there, that's all right as well. <laughs> Ron, can I just ask, was the Garden of Eden before the fall a, uh, a form of heaven? God walked with man, yeah. man was faultless. I'm sure it was. Was that a picture of heaven? And is heaven a restor or the, the new heaven, the new earth, a restoration of the Garden of Eden? Well, I, I think it is. I think the Garden of Eden was an embryo, what heaven would be. Because there was obviously room for development in there and in the developing of man's character. Um, so there were, and there were trials that had to be 
um, kind of resisted there. In heaven, there'll be no trials. Um, and there'll be no progressions in likeness to Jesus in, the, in, in that so sense. It, the, 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 that, that's right. There's, o- there's only one tree. And, and that tree, of course, is there. It's, um, it, it, there's lots of trees, like you say in the book of the Revelation. And they're always at autumn. They're always giving their fruit every month. Um, but so, you see, all the times has gone, it, it, doesn't, it can't work like that if they're trees. You, 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 it can't be. <laughs> Are you following this? It, it's just, it's a completely different concept of time where everything is vibrant and alive and not boring. Um, and what we'll be, do, be doing, will we be singing hymns all day? Well, <laughs> he promises that those who overcome and he promises that those who serve him will have cities to rule over. I'm not bothered about the ruling, but serving. If, if we have served him now, he has bigger jobs for us later. I'm excited <laughs> and a bit daunted. <laughs> Anybody else got any questions? Steve. You said it so much better than I could say. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> if you look at Revelation, though, there's one point where the beheaded saints or whatever, he sees the souls of those beheaded, yeah. you know, crying out. It's almost as if they haven't actually got a body, but they, they, they're in the presence of Christ. And, and, I, and that is very careful of time. But do, 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 do you want to yeah. say Yeah, but, but the, the, I think... Okay. Um, just repeat the question or speak, that, that, that implies that I understood it. Um, <laughs> Steve, could you come and ask? He's got a mic. Okay. Okay, for those of you in Zoom land, um, uh, yeah, you very br- the question. Yeah, okay, very brief. In Revelation, it talks at some point about, uh, I think, people who've been martyred, uh, beheaded. And uh, I saw the souls of those who've been beheaded in the altar, and they were crying out, you know, Lord, how long? Is there some sense, though, that, that those that go to being in God's presence, I know time is different, um, that they're, they're in their, in Christ's presence, but they don't necessarily need to have a body to be in his presence? Do you, do you, do you see? Uh, okay, I, let it, me, let, I've got an answer. I don't know what you'll think of it, but I've got an answer. You, you, you remember I, I said we'd come back to that verse in Peter? where it says that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. That doesn't mean that sometimes God sees things in kind of slow motion or in time capture. You know, we, we have the technology now to speed up time on a video or to slow it down. It seems to me that God doesn't have to make those options at one and the same time he can see an hour a day and give it the spread of a thousand years and watch the development of every single thing in it and miss nothing. And at the same time, he can see um, a thousand years and, and see that thousand years in its impact and relevance concentrated to a single day um, at the same time so t- God isn't trapped in time as we are and I think John as he, he comes up hither into the heavenly places uh, he isn't trapped in time either and I think that's one of the reasons we need to be cautious about trying to impose um, a timetable on the book of the Revelation and saying this chapter follows this chapter because to me it, it, it's plainly cyclical it, you, you come to something and then you come back to the same point but from a different perspective um, so I would say that the souls that uh, is at one moment in time you can see them there if you like from, from the moment when they were 
decapitated. Um, at that moment, the cry kind of goes up, how long? But at the same time, they're also part of the people who are this crowd were worshipping him. But we, we, we are bound to split time up into hours, minutes, and seconds and say number two has to follow number three, uh, no, number one, etc. We, we insist on sequential time. Um, but time doesn't necessarily need to be sequential. If, if you have, like God has, the ability to see the big and the small at the same time, the thousand years and the one day in a single moment. Um, and, and the preach. I, I often say that I, I, I like, I'm not, I would love to be able to write poetry. I can't do it, but they, don't, they always come out as limericks. Um, <laughs> um, but um, I, I, to me, one of the, the wonders of kind of a poet or an artist is that they can capture a moment a look, a word, um, and make it last long enough for you to look at it and appreciate it. Do you understand what I mean by that? You, they, they, they capture a moment and you, and you think, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you stopped time for me so that I can see that for a moment. Maybe we'll have some of those abilities. We'll be able to stop. There's an amazing thing it says. It says we shall know even as we are known. We shall know. And yet no tears. So we'll be able to see all the disasters that we incurred and caused. All the things that went wrong. And somehow we'll see the glory of God's redemption in them. And the way he solved them. And feel no sorrow. No tears. No sorrow. No mourning. No death. All that's done with. Um, these are kind of impossible things for us to imagine. I just feel almost at the edges of my mind, I just get a glimpse. You know how with peripheral vision, you can see things move. And if you actually turn your head and look at it, it, it isn't moving. And there are some things, I think, as you're reading the scriptures, you glimpse something at the edge of your vision. And you say, yeah, I see it. But if you look at it, it no, I can't see it now. It's kind of <laughs> Here's a cup. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. Let's pray. Oh, Father, what a plan you had for our race. That we should have a past, a present, and a future. That we should be with you where you are. Unto the age of the ages to the eternity of eternity and yet Lord every moment vibrant living God conscious as that thing continues to say and there will be the throne of God and the Lamb and his servant shall see his face Lord with no barriers, no hindrances, no, no cloud, no curtain in between. Somehow, Lord, you will have prepared us then to bear a look at the infinite God and to know that he's our Father. Lord, it really does take our breath away. And I pray, Lord, that this hope that you set before us, Lord, that you will use it to quicken us, to strengthen us, to empower us to live this day and the next day and the next day as they come to us in the power of your Spirit. I do pray, Lord, that you will make these truths what they were intended to be not mysteries to be solved, but truths to bring hope and patient endurance and a clarity that God is still on the throne and he will remember his own. 
Though trials may press us and burdens oppress us, he never will leave us alone. God is still on the throne and he will not forget you. I've forgotten it. <laughs> um, it's a wonderful old chorus. Thank you, Father. Thank you for that. Lord, I want to pray, Lord, for all those who have lost dear ones in recent months, Lord, and for those who, who will still have questions. I pray, Lord, I, I remember how the disciples of John, when they were troubled that John had been beheaded, the scripture records that they came and told Jesus. I pray, Lord, for those who are still feeling the smart of sorrow and loss. I pray, Lord, that you'll teach them how to come and tell Jesus, how to come and open their hearts and not feel any shame of any of their questions, but simply just to pour it out before you, Lord, and to know that you're ever a father to us and you know us where we are. And you promise empowering spirit to us, Lord, who will enable us to walk in your way and to overcome and to inherit all the promises. And remind them, Lord, that this is a season. If, if Lord, the trials that beset us, they are but for a season and they will pass and we shall be enriched by them if we don't waste them. I pray, Lord, that in all the sorrows and all the questions that have no answers, I pray, Lord, you'll teach us just to come and tell Jesus how we feel, how we're hurting, how you didn't do what we thought you would do and then just be quiet and wait, Lord, for your hand on our shoulder and your healing touch. If we're trapped, Lord, with the video of events and they keep recycling and we see them and we rehearse them and we think what might have been and how we could have done this and how we might have done that, Lord, help us to be diligent and decisive and to say, I will not review this. The past is past. I'll put this into the hands of God where it's absolutely safe. And I'll tell him how I feel. Oh, Father, we pray for one another. See us through these times, Lord, and in the midst of them, be glorified. Amen. Amen. Amen.